yes, as he said, I'm a, uh, what's called a participating scientist on the uh, Mars Science Laboratory. And I was uh, selected for that group of uh, 29 people uh, just about the time that it was launched, the, the launch of the satellite, which was in November of 2011. And this group of scientists are, in addition to the many scientists and engineers who work on the instruments on board. And the, this, is, uh, this last group that was added, that I'm part of, was designed, was, their goal is really to help guide the rover when it's on the surface. And so on a daily basis, almost, we, uh, we look at the images that have come from Mars and uh, help the engineers and the scientists, all the other scientists, figure out where we're going to go, what we're going to do over the next uh, day or so. So um, I always like to start a talk about um, ocean, uh, about this topic or almost any topic I speak on, uh, with this image, these images uh, that relate to the discovery of hydrothermal vents. Oregon State University was the lead institution in the discovery of hydrothermal vents back in 1977. And the, the leader of that group was Jack Corliss, who was in the, in the bottom of this, this image. It shows him holding one of the giant clams that they collected at that time. And the, the study area is, was the Galapagos Islands, or near the Galapagos Islands, uh, it, uh, in a volcanic rift that was between the Pacific Ocean Plate and the or the, the Cocos Plate and the Nazca Plate in the Pacific Ocean. So it's somewhere between uh, the Galapagos Islands and South America. Uh, the upper uh, right picture shows Jack Corliss and Jack Diamond, another oceanography professor, uh, standing in front of Alvin, which was the submersible that they used to, uh, dis to make the discovery. And on the bottom right is a picture of the discovery. What they were extremely surprised to find whole communities of living organisms on the bottom. And it's from that particular discovery that we then started to realize that there are whole communities on Earth that really are independent of the sun. They get, they get their energy and their nutrients not from food that's created by plants, but by chemical energy that's in the Earth. So um, the clams, for example, eat uh, microorganisms, uh, bacteria and, and smaller that, uh, and small organisms that um, get their energy from things that come out of the earth. And here's this next picture is an example of some of those things. So hydrogen sulfide, which is that stinky gas that comes from rotting eggs and is poisonous to humans. There are bacteria that use it. To, uh, as their food. Uh, hydrogen, which can be generated inside the earth uh, without, uh, by reaction of water with, with uh, rocks, uh, is also another source of food for these bacteria that live in this, in the, uh, inside the earth. Uh, I, there's a pic image here showing hydro um, methane, natural gas, which is another food source. And finally, on the lower right, there's a picture of a rock. That rock is probably about as big as my fist. And you can see these gr green minerals in it. They're called olivine. And we know that bacteria can use that particular mineral as, as a food source. Just They live off that mineral plus water in, um, in the ocean floor, at least, and also possibly on uh, underground on, on the continents. We put some of this green mineral in the seafloor and let it sit there isolated about a few hundred feet below the seafloor in a, in, a, in a well, a borehole that was drilled into the seafloor, and brought the mineral back four years later. And uh, a graduate student that I'm advising with another faculty member found hundreds of kinds of bacteria living on this particular green mineral. And then she brought it back to the lab, and she's able to grow these bacteria with only that green mineral and water. So we know that there are bacteria underneath the seafloor that are able to use the minerals in the seafloor as their food source. So 
That's probably one of the reasons I was selected on this team, because Mar uh, the rover is looking for places on Mars where maybe life could exist uh, and use the, the uh, natural chemistry of Mars as a food source. Okay, this particular image uh, it's kind of shows the history of the universe. With, with galaxies in, in the sky, uh, the uh, formation of the Earth on the lower left, uh, and the complex molecules that then form into more uh, simple molecules that form into more complex molecules. If you follow that, that uh, white stream that goes across the bottom from left to right, that's kind of the evolution of, of life from the very beginning to today. And for most of that white line, life was, was just bacteria. In fact, uh, if you start from where the um, little curved uh, things are, about a third of the way across this white line, it's probably where a life originated on Earth. Before that, it was just chemi chemicals. And life got more complex and larger as you went along this, this white line until you got to uh, where life actually came up on land. The length of that line in terms of years is probably about three billion years. It took a long time for life to get from bacteria up onto the continents. So we're pretty sure the bottom line of this uh, slide says that uh, the Earth has been habitable for at least 3.8 billion of its 4.5 billion years. A long time. Life was, the Earth has been habitable. So I want to pose a question, or two questions to you, um, before I give, show you some two more slides. And they are, do you think there's life elsewhere in the solar system? And by little star means, so we're not counting people on, this, on the International Space Station. That doesn't, that, that doesn't count. And uh, we're not counting bacteria that might have been attached to a satellite or something that was launched into space. So we're talking about life that's sustaining itself on its own uh, on some other place in the solar system. So that's the first question. And of course, we're considering life as we know it. And we, could imagine all, we can imagine all kinds of life that uh, isn't what we know. So we're talking about carbon-based life, um, something that reacts to its environment, can grow, divide, and evolve. So that's the question, first question. Second one, after you've thought about that first one, what do you think about elsewhere in our galaxy? Now, I have to say that our galaxy is only one of about 100 billion galaxies out there. So we're not talking about a big part of the universe. We're talking about our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. So here's some background on this question. So we have. Um, in our, in our solar system, we've got uh, eight planets and one dwarf planet, and about 150 moons. So there's a lot of places out there in our solar system where you might find life. So Mars, well, let me start with Earth. Earth we know is water, and it has water because it's just the right distance from the sun, so that the surface is somewhere between freezing and boiling. And so the water on the surface can be, remain liquid. That's what's called the, the Goldilocks zone just the right temperature, not too hot and not too cold. Now Mars is a little bit farther out, so it's outside the Goldilocks zone and its surface is frozen. But it does have water below the surface. And there are eight moons that orbit some of the planets that also apparently have water below the surface. So we got about 10 places in the solar system where there's, there's water present and we know that there's, where there's water below the surface on Earth that you can have bacteria living in that water. So now, how many people think there's life elsewhere in the solar system? Eh, that's probably about average for, for scientists and as well, maybe about 50%. And actually, what's one reason why we've, we've, they've decided to go to Mars is to explore, to see if it is habitable. So the next question is, Outside of our solar system, elsewhere in our galaxy, um, do you think there's life? And the, the background for this question is, um, this, this is a picture of an artist a drawing of our, our galaxy, and it shows our solar system in one of the spiral arms way out at the edge. Uh, has, and uh, it shows uh, 
the diameter of the galaxy, about 80,000 light years. It takes a long time for light to get across the galaxy. But the point is that there are about 300 billion stars in, the, in, the, in our galaxy. And recent studies with a satellite called Kepler now probably says that there are about 300, 600 billion of those stars out there that have planets that are in the Goldilocks zone. So unlike our solar system, where we have one, uh, there are solar systems out there with more than one planet in them that are in the Goldilocks zone. So there are about somewhere around 600 billion planets that could be like Earth out there. So it makes it sound like there's a lot of opportunities for life out there. Okay, so that's the background for this, this talk, and I now want to go to the main point, part of it, which is, you know, what about the possibility of life on Mars? And this is a kind of a, a nearly true color image of Mars, and it's, expand, it's stretched out, so it's not a sphere in this picture, and the, and the top and the bottom show that the, the ice caps, there's a water ice cap at the top and a carbon dioxide ice cap at the bottom. And it has set, uh, some yellow uh, names on it. Those are places where uh, we've sent landers that have been able to um, examine the surface. And there's uh, four white ones that were the candidates for the current lander, uh, the uh, Curiosity Mars Science Laboratory. And Gale Crater, over on the right, is the one that was finally selected. And that was selected because the, um, uh, it had a big mountain in the center that had a lot of sediment on it, and sediments are the recorder of uh, the history of the planet, and uh, they thought that maybe it'll tell the, uh, the climate history from, from looking at the sediments. So the next picture uh, again shows Mars, but now colored by elevation, so the, the white mountain there on the right is the highest point on this side of the planet. Uh, it's about 45,000 feet high, quite a high mountain. Uh, the blue is the deeper parts of the, of the planet. You can see it's, it's lower in the north and then the south, and the reds are the southern highlands. You see um, the Gale Crater outlined with the circle on the, near the bottom, and you can see a little tiny mountain in the middle, and I want to go to look at that a little bit more in detail. So this is the crater, and um, pointer show up. Okay, uh, so there's the crater rim, about 100 kilometers across. Uh, here's the mountain in the middle that they want to uh, want to eventually uh, uh, go to, and this was the uh, place where they wanted to land. And they picked this because it was very smooth, uh, not very tilted, and uh, I want to point out that there was this word called the fan up here on, on Earth. We have places where water rushes out of the mountains and across the deserts and leaves what's called, uh, what's called an alluvial fan. And they had realized there's an alluvial fan on the edge of this crater, which suggested that there was water that had flowed into the crater. So now I want to um, look, just show you the, that alluvial fan. Again, it shows the the landing ellipse, as they call it, the place where they think they're going to land. And there's a little tiny X in here which, uh, that shows where they did land. And this alluvial fan, which comes down into the crater and spread rocks, theoretically spread rocks, some maybe as far as where we landed. And you, you might be able to see there's a little tiny lake, a little tiny depression, which we think was, has been a, was a lake. Now, how did we get there? And I always love to show this video, and I hope it works. Um, and um, I get nervous every time I watch that. <laughs> okay, so we got to the surface. What an amazing um, engineering feat that was. So here's the rover now, uh, artist concept of, of it being on the surface. And one thing you'll notice right away is that NASA likes to use acronyms. It's <laughs> Every instrument has an acronym, and uh, 
that was one of the hard things to do, actually um, get used to when I started working with them. In fact, they, they published pages of acronyms, and I would print them out, and I would keep them handy so that I could look through and find out what the heck they were talking about. But just, uh, just briefly, I want to say that um, these are the main instruments that are on the rover. For example, DAN measures water s below the surface, sends neutrons into the ground, and when they bounce, uh, how, taking how long and how many bounce back tells you how deep and how much water is there. REMS is telling us the, the temperature and the humidity of the surface and the, and the wind. Uh, and really importantly are, are the cameras, of which there are many. Uh, there's this one, there, there are some below the chassis that are looking front and back. Uh, there, uh, there's actually several in this, uh, this uh, camera ad here. And uh, this device over here, which is called the drill, scoop, brush, and sieves, is how it reaches out and collects samples and uh, puts them into two of the instruments that needs to have the, the soil inside them in order to measure it, and that's SAM, which uh, measures, uh, or can measure organic compounds, uh, and chemin, which can measure the mineralogy, tell you what minerals are actually in the salt, soil. This has never been done before. Um, so they got it on the ground, and they wanted to check out their instruments. And the first thing they did was they, they looked around, and they looked at that mountain that they had to climb, and uh, they looked at the how to get there, and, and they know that, that there's a, a big field of sand dunes between where they are now and where they have to go. They also knew, looked around and said, gee, there's a, there looks like that lake bottom. It could be that lake bottom off to the side. It's not the direction we need to go, but let's go over there and look at it. And so they headed off actually in the direction opposite to what they needed to go to get around the sand dunes. And what did they do first? Well, this is what they did. <laughs> Curiosity killed the cat. Uh, this is a cartoon that showed up on the internet just shortly after we landed, and it's been great fun. So in reality, uh, we started out at this place called Bradbury Landing, which was a, a place of gravel. Uh, and although we, need, we, we wanted to go, we, the original intent was to go this way, we ended up going this way to get to this place called Yellowknife Bay, where they thought there might be some lake deposits. On the way, uh, so, uh, so this line with all the little numbers on it uh, tells you the, the, what they call the sols. Now, a Mars day is 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. So uh, if it's noon on Mars and Earth at the same time, for example, the next day at noon, we're still waiting for noon to happen on, on Mars. It still has, it takes another 40 minutes for it to happen. So they measure the days on Mars by calling them sols, and these are the sols that, uh, along the path. And I've labeled a couple things here. This one called conglomerates, this one called sand, and this one called mudstone. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the things that we did along the way to Yellowknife Bay. So one of the first things we ran across were these tilted up rocks, which are conglomerates. And uh, con here's a, this is not from Mars, this is just a conglomerate from Earth, but we know what co conglomerates look like. They're made up of rounded pebbles, and they're held together with, with uh, some sort of uh, cement, which can be mud or uh, another mineral that fills in the spaces around. So when we saw these, we said, we know that we're dealing with a place where gravel was left on the ground, and was held, then held together with some sort of uh, cement, which probably meant water was not only carried the gravel there, but was around long enough to, to uh, get it cemented together. And these are two different examples of the, of the uh, conglomerate uh, along that path. And the next picture shows uh, a, an example of the conglomerate on Mars and the conglomerate on, on Earth. So, Pretty sure we're in an area now where water has rushed out of the mountain, probably off of that, off of that fan, that alluvial fan, out into the shallow part of the, of the crater, deep part of the crater. So that was a very exciting find, and it happened within uh, the first, uh, well, the next picture shows you that uh, the conglomerates were found right off, so right near the landing site, and then around uh, Sol 26, and then around Sol 38, so in the first, you know, 30 to 40 days of being on Mars, 
we had a, a major discovery of these conglomerates. So uh, we then kept going, uh, and we had to test out some of the instruments, and one of the ways that we were going to do that was to pick up some sand and put it into uh, SAM, the Surface Analysis on Mars instrument, and into the X-ray Diffraction instrument. And to get a sand, we had to find a place where there was enough sand to actually pick up, because the scoop can only scoop uh, if, the, if it was deep enough. You couldn't, couldn't actually pick up solid rock. You had to pick up uh, soft sand. So after uh, we traveled quite some ways toward the lake, we came across a very tiny dune. And it's just shown, um, is it showing up? Yep. Here's, here's the crest of the dune running, running along here. And the first thing we did was drive the rover up onto the dune and spin one of the wheels. So to, see, and to actually dig a hole. To see, okay, how deep is this sand? Is it deep enough for us to get this scoop? And so that was successful. And you can see next to, a, next to the, um, the uh, scuff mark, they called it, you can see where this, this little scoop, it's only about this big, like, like large, like a tablespoon, really, uh, scooped up material. And they, they practiced a couple times. And then they were ready to, to put it into the, uh, into, the, uh, into the instruments that are inside the machine. And you can see, you also wonder, well, how, how does this thing take a picture of itself? Who was there to take that picture? <laughs> that cat. Yeah, yeah, it was a, that's a good point. Maybe it was that cat, but that cat was dead. So uh, they, they called this the Cancun picture. You know, you go, to, you go on vacation and you get your cell phone and you hold it out and you take your picture. Well, what they did was with a camera on the end of an arm, uh, it took, they took their picture 55 times and then stitched them all together digitally to make an, an, an image. And you can't really see the arm in this picture because they, they always took the picture, they took the, those parts out. So it looks like there's nothing there taking the picture. And the Mount, Mount Sharp is in, in the background. So uh, next picture is um, of some this, the scoop holes. And the reason I put these in here is, is they have a very light layer. It's just a few, uh, a few, few centimeters below the surface. And this puzzled everybody for a long time. And they have not come to a good conclusion about what this light layer is yet. Uh, but my opinion is that it's a place where frost accumulates almost every night in the, in the daytime, I mean, in, in, the, in the summertime. So you get a thin layer of frost. Now, the surface of that dune goes above freezing every day in, in the summer. So between daytime, when it's warm, and nighttime, when it gets very cold, about 100 degrees colder, you have this time when you can make frost below the surface. So every day, you have a tiny bit of water forming below the surface, and then it quickly evaporates because the pressure is so low. I think it's a place where, first of all, you could have water right below the surface, and where it's slowly leached out the soluble parts of the soil, and uh, they've been removed. We'll work more on that. It could be very interesting, but I think it's very exciting that there could be water right below the surface almost every day in the summer. OK, so that sand was over here. And then we continued downhill to this, uh, what's called Yellowknife Bay, which looks like it had, had uh, mud in it. And here's the picture. Here's a picture of what once was mud. Now it's solidified. It's, you can see the, the ripples in, in the mud, uh, and it turns out to be extremely soft. This is where they first decided to try and drill into the, into it, into the, and test out the drill and see what, it was, see what they could find. So the next picture shows two drill holes. And they look big, about this big around, only about a, a centimeter or so in diameter. Uh, but they have an imager, and so they were able to get this soil from this drilled hole and pick it up and put it into the two, of the, the two of the instruments. And I want to show you, I didn't show you much about the instruments, but this, this one is, is really kind of, well, they're all really cool, but this one, this one is very interesting. Look, you know, what, what is that thing? <laughs> it's actually a tuning fork. And it's a tuning fork, and at the top of each one, there's an opening, and there are actually all 
a whole bunch of these tuning forks arranged in a big flat plate that can rotate. So they, they get the, the piece of the tuning fork that they, they want to put the sample in, they put it near the top, and they dump the sample in it. And you can see it has a little window in it, they have little windows in it. And they shine x-rays through the window. And in, in this picture, you don't see the screen, but there's a screen behind the, the, these little windows. And the x-rays sp spread out by hitting the crystals that are, in, that are dumped in there. And the pattern that's made by the, the x-rays tells you what minerals are in each one of in those. And the reason it's a tuning fork is that on, when you do this on Earth, you want your sample to be randomly oriented. You, want, you don't want all the crystals to line up. You want them to be all in different orientations. You can't really do that on Mars very easily. So what they did is they said, we'll make, we'll make these uh, little holders vibrate. So we'll, we'll, we'll vibrate the whole thing so that they're always moving, and so you'll get a random uh, orientation of the minerals. And so the next picture shows the screen, two screens. And so the x-rays have gone through the sample, and they've spread out, and they've made circles. And the size of the circle and the position, the position of the circle, the distance from the very center, so the x-rays, if they didn't get scattered at all by the minerals, would end up right here in the middle. And so the, uh, you can see there are some differences between them. For example, there's a, a ring here that doesn't occur over here. That means there was a mineral in the mud so that, that was the mud, drilled mud, that wasn't in, in the sand. And what this has told us, one, is that there are minerals in the mud that are made of, that, that need that uh, stinky egg gas as, as one of their components. Hydrogen sulfide makes sulfide minerals. We know that those sulfide minerals are in this uh, mudstone. We also know that there's this word Phyllosilicate, that just means that there are minerals that contain water that are clays. Uh, so we know that there was water in this mudstone at one point, which seems obvious. So we, we know that there was water. We know that there were uh, elements like the hydrogen sulfide that um, the bacteria could use. And we also know that green mineral that I showed early on is also in this sample. So we got several sources of food for bacteria. We have water. Um, we probably have an environment that could have had bacteria in the past. And then finally, before leaving Yellowknife Bay, this is another view of the um, uh, area. And it uh, shows sedimentary rocks that were probably carried by water and left, and then partly solidified, and then eroded. There's a lot of wind on Mars, although the atmosphere is very thin. There's, there's enough wind to slowly erode the surface uh, and that's probably what's happened to this uh, sandstone. So, um, what, did we, what have we learned? Um, well, just in, a, in about a year, we've learned there were streams that carried uh, and cr uh, created uh, gravel beds that were then solidified. We know that there was a lake, and from the minerals in that mudstone, we know that the water in that lake was fresh. It wasn't real salty. That sounds good. In fact, the uh, Project scientist said if he had been there, he would have drunk that water. It was fresh enough to drink. Uh, we know that that mud in that lake had uh, minerals that uh, could support bacteria, and uh, the lake itself probably could have supported bacterial life. So uh, that's about where we will end. Uh, so there's, there's again our goal. Now we have, we're turning around, and we are heading now. We are really heading toward the mountain and we're trying to make tracks as fast as we can. And this is, this is the path uh, that we are now taking. So we've spent our time in Yellowknife Bay looking at that mud, and now we're heading out toward this way. We're gonna head south, southwest along this path. Uh, looks like probably in the next day or so, so, we will be looking at this little row of hills. Uh, people are very curious about what that is. Uh, and uh, we have plotted already a path to about about right about here. We may end, in fact, it may be driving right now, uh, heading toward a space that's a, sp a spot that's right about here. So that's all I want to say, and I'll stay for questions if people want to. Question way in the back. 
Do you know the reasoning behind the naming of Yellowknife Bay? Yeah, the name. Not very accurate <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, the idea was to find a place, uh, a mapped area that had lots of places with names on it, and they picked a area of um, Canada, and Yellowknife Bay was part of that. So uh, there are lots of names. Many of them, because of where they selected the area, are Eskimo names, which are unpronounceable. So if you see things on the internet about a place name, it's because it came from a map up in northern Canada. <laughs> so I noticed those layered rocks are fairly flat. Uh, the conglomerate is slightly tilted. So how much structures do you see there? And also, have you seen the, uh, did you map the relationship between the different layers in the lake and the time yes. sequence? So the, uh, the question was, what, what's, you know, the, some things are tilted, and uh, may some, maybe some are less tilted. You know, what's happening there? Uh, and do we know which layer is on the bottom and which one's on the top? And uh, because we went down into Yellowknife Bay, we were able to see you know, which layer is on the bottom, which is the next. And uh, we were also able to tell how they're tilted. The, the conglomerate that was tilted was probably tilted by an impact, because it was all seemed to be lifted up in the, in the the same direction. We don't have the other side of the crater, which is, seems to be gone, but that conglomerate was probably uh, lifted up by a crater, by an impact. So basically, there was no structure. <coughs> we'll get back to that. Another question? What's the best place for the public to see images? So the best place to see the images at, is at the Mars Science Laboratory NASA website. And you get to see the images as soon as the scientists do. They, they get posted there every day. So it's, it's really a great site. And there's a lot of uh, very nice images there. So what's, what's the speaking on what happened to the running water? So where, the question, where, where did the running water go? Uh, there's certainly ice and, and water vapor in the atmosphere now. There's, there's a fair amount. But because the surface is mostly below freezing, it's likely that m the water is frozen underground. If you get down deep enough, because every planet gets warmer as you go down, there should be a, a, a depth, at maybe a mile or two, where you're, you're actually above the freezing point again, and, and you will have water below the surface. So likely most of the water is frozen in, in the ground. But isn't that, doesn't uh, the fact that there was flowing water imply that the climate was hotter earlier in Mars history? So the, the fact that there was water, uh, does that mean that there was the well, there's, there's evidence for flowing water yeah. on the surface. So the question is whether the flowing water was periodic, it happens once in a while, and or whether it was continuous for, for a long time. And a lot of people think that early on, Mars had a very similar climate to Earth. It was, for some reason, it was very warm, uh, had surface water for a long time, which has a lot of people speculating that if, the, if Mars and Earth were the same at the beginning, and life on Earth appeared very quickly after Earth became habitable. Maybe the same thing happened on Mars. What, what, what kind of information from the rover would lead you to speculate that there, there are indeed signs of, of life? That, what, what, what kind of data are you looking for? So the question is, you know, what are we looking for that might really tell us that there was life there. And, and NASA is very careful to say that they're not looking for life. They're looking for evidence that it could have been there. Um, so the key thing would be probably be whether there are complex organic molecules, like a sugar or a, something complex like that. And th they do have an instrument which is capable of detecting them. And it is looking very carefully. Uh, they, and they're being very quiet about what they're getting. Because if, if, first of all, they don't want to say they found it and then make a mistake. That, that would be very bad. Um, so they're being very careful to make sure that they've looked at every piece of data very, uh, very thoroughly before they, they make an announcement. So weather and, and unique geology, I was curious about the the weather instrumentation can 
the unknown weather patterns and, and whatnot, I was wondering about, about natural geological processes mimicking what we recognize as signs of life or signs of, of water. That is our understanding of the, the natural physical processes such that it's easy to distinguish those? So um, I guess the question is, are we going to get fooled by seeing something that... that Geological examples being sold as fossilized dinosaur food. <laughs> then, then it turns out, you know, that's a hoax. Well, I, so, yeah, yeah. so are we going to see something that may be life and we call it life and it's not evidence for life? Um, I think this is a really cautious group of scientists. So everything that gets presented to the public actually gets presented by the scientists amongst themselves first, and they're very, very critical. So. Um, it's actually quite a lot of fun. You put out an idea, and you find out right away that this group of really smart people really know what's going on. And uh, so that's happened to me. So <laughs> they're over here. Will be found in the solar system. And in your mind, what's the if, if so, what's the most likely candidates for location? Um, my opinion. So the question is, will we find life in the solar system? And my opinion is yes. I think we will find it. And uh, I think it's what um, Christian de Duve wrote uh, in his book, Vital Dust. He was, a, he was a Nobel Prize winner in medicine, and he started writing about the origin of life. He, he called it the cosmic imperative, that when the conditions are right, life will appear. So I think that that will happen. And where? Where would that happen? I mean, we've got probably one of the most interesting places right now and easiest to sample is Enceladus, which is a, a moon of Saturn. And it's got water below the surface and an ice cap, and somehow that water is getting pressurized and shooting it into, into space. So if there was anything living in that water, uh, flying through that, that now ice, ice particles, would probably tell you if there was anything living in that planet. So that's a, that's a really interesting area to look for. Yes? Why did the crystals in the X-ray diffraction need to be randomized? Wouldn't you get a better signal if they're all oriented the same way? You get really so the question is why do they have to be randomized? If if they were all oriented the same way, yes, you'd get a very strong signal. Um, but I think you want to um, that might that might overpower a, a, a mineral that's like in very minor amounts. So so it's the, the 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 technique is good to minerals that are abundant to down to one one or two percent. So um, you want to be able to see all the minerals, so maybe if you have one really dominant one, you might not see the weak one. And there might be people here, actually, who could actually answer that better than I, since I'm not an X-ray crystallographer. Maybe one more. Um, back at the beginning, you mentioned that the northern ice cap is water ice, and the southern ice cap is CO2 ice. Why is that? So the question is why are the two, two po uh, polar caps different? And uh, it has to do with their elevation. So the, the, southern, the northern polar cap is very low, and for some reason that accumulates the water. Uh, the, the, the southern cap is much higher elevation, as you saw in the, the colored map where it was blue in the north and red in the, in the south just because of elevation. And, and for some reason the CO2 accumulates in the, at the higher elevations, not the lower. I think there is CO2 in the, in the northern ice cap as well.